A warm welcome to Björn Dahlöf, uh, CMO of Sereno Scientific, Victor Westman, uh, fund manager at Excelity Fonder, and our equity analyst, Christian Binder. Thank you. So Sereno is a Gothenburg-based biotech company developing novel drug treatments for cardiovascular diseases. More specifically, the company is currently developing leak candidate CS1 um, in pulmonary, pulmonary arterial hypertension um, with a top line readout expected in uh, Q4 of this year. Furthermore, the, two co the company's two other projects, CS585 and CS014, um, um, are currently in preclinical development and expected to be ready for the clinic next year. And Björn, I want to start off um, discussing CS1 and PAH. Um, could you just elaborate on the already um, several um, approved treatments for PH? How do you think the standard of care treatment will develop in the coming years and how does CS1 fit into the picture? I mean, PH is a, is a very severe disease and um, we have had uh, progress in, in uh, finding new drugs, but they have mainly been vasodilators and not been able to really address the long-term survival and disease progression. So there is a need for newer therapies and hopefully with CS1 we will have something that could offer more of disease modification and improving the situation for the patient. But uh, I think that if you look at how the development of new guidelines for PH will be. It will be that you combine different drugs, so it's not that older drugs will be obsolete and newer drugs will take over. I think that will be combination, like you have seen in, for example, heart failure, where you now have mainly, let's say, four or five drugs, which all benefit uh, to the patient's uh, uh, survival. Understood. And um, looking at um, preclinical data that uh, Steen showed in his presentation, um, there seems to be pretty promising data in mouse models of PAH um, with valproic acid. Um, looking at, for example, so Tadercept, um, which also showed good preclinical data and then also an effect in the clinic. How transferable do you think um, those preclinical data are um, to the clinic? I think that the models and uh, usually two models that are used in, in uh, preclinical -cl development, uh, that's the monocrotaline model and the Sogean hypoxia model. You can uh, look at both prevention of disease and therapeutic effects in already established disease. If you have data showing good effects in those models, it has been historically um, possible to also show beneficial data in the clinic. I think what is coming into the, the um, therapy now and, and into newer therapies like Sotatelcept, uh, like CS1, is that it goes more to the core of the disease, that is the vascular remodeling. And we, we talk about these days about reverse remodeling, meaning that you go more to the actual uh, cause of the disease, even though it's... Uh, basically unknown the real cause, but the, the readout of the cause is the vascular remodeling. And if you can affect that profoundly, that means that you also have a greater opportunity to change the disease progression and ultimately, hopefully, prolong the life of the patient. Understood. And uh, picking up on, as you said, uh, current treatments mainly treat these symptoms, but the older grade, so to speak, would be mm. developing disease-modifying treatments. Um, at the same time, um, as far as I understand, for um, a lot of PAH cases, it's not entirely clear what actually the underlying disease mechanism is. So how do you approach developing disease-modifying um, treatments? I mean, first of all, there is no real definition, I mean, accepted definition of disease modifying therapy. It's a hope that you can really reverse the whole process, of course, but, uh, but how to define it and how to um, uh, document it for a single drug is more difficult. But I think one of the components is actually that you can reverse the remodeling of the, of the vascular tour of the pulmonary circulation. That means that what all of these patients have 
almost uh, irrespective of the real cause is that they have a remodeling, meaning that the wall of the vessel becomes thicker, means that the resistance for the blood to go through the lungs increases, that the pressure increases, and then you get secondary effects there, fibrosis, you get uh, inflammation, and ultimately also thrombosis in, in, in these vessels, increasing the pressure and the burden on the right ventricle. So if you want to show really that you can affect the disease progression and be a disease modifying therapy is that you can show that you affect these uh, vascular changes. And one of the attempts that have been done is that y if you can discontinue therapy and still have an effect, still have a pressure reduction, still have a uh, reduction of the uh, resistance, then you are on the right way towards a disease modifying therapy. Very interesting. I'm, um, I'm uh, curious about the study design. Uh, it's, uh, I think in general, it's a minefield and maybe especially when you have a, a lot of advantage in the, in the effect profile as you maybe less as you have in the CS1 study so can you talk to us a little bit about your ca track record in designing studies and common uh, mistakes that you uh, avoid <laughs> you mean m m me personally or uh, both both I, I presume you are very much uh, um, i mean i can i can say that um, the whole career my 40 years in in research and and, and clinic have been devoted to designing trials mainly in cardiovascular and I have like 400 publications on these things. So I can say I have experience but we also collaborate with very experienced PIH people and in particular we have a collaboration with Professor Raymond Bensa who is one of the key opinion leaders in, in this area and he has helped us with the design of the trial. And I think we have come to a very interesting and innovative trial design since we use the so-called CardioMEMS technology, which means that we implant a pressure sensor and we can monitor the pressure continuously in these patients. We can monitor total pulmonary vascular resistance and how the right ventricle uh, performs, meaning that we have something that other, tri other uh, drug trials have not used before, m meaning they can usually look at these things at the beginning of the trial and at the end of the trial with invasive methods. So I think we have managed to, uh, to design a trial with very interesting uh, features and also being able to monitor the effect of CS1 in, in much more in-depth than uh, other, other drug trials can do. And when it comes to uh, screening and selection, mm. how, m how, many, how, how many, how much screening do you need to do to, to reach the 30 patients? Yeah, I mean, first of all, this is a rare disease, so uh, there are not so many patients uh, available. And then we have, of course, have set certain criteria uh, and we have both inclusion and exclusion criteria. So, of course, there is a screening procedure that needs to take place. So it's not all of the patients with PAH that can participate. But how many exactly we need to screen, that is not um, uh, ex exactly for me to say, but I know we go to these uh, specialist centers which have regional responsibility for this disease. They have several hundreds of patients in, in their clinics usually. So I think that to ha have our three to five patients, three to four patients in each center, we probably need to screen most of their database to, to find those patients. Yes, I think so.
Right. And uh, looking at your um, readouts for um, your coming phase mm. two trial, um, as you said, you have the CardioMAMS device uh, from a collaboration with Abbott. You have um, a variety of uh, traditional and novel um, efficacy readouts. Now, the primary endpoint is um, safety, but still, um, do you think uh, we will already be able to gauge um, CS1's efficacy in pH? I mean, we try to hone in on all relevant aspects of the disease with this different exploratory uh, endpoints or objectives. So I think that we will have a very good picture, even though this trial is not powered to be the definitive proof of concept pivotal trial. It's more of a, as you say, safety tolerability study with a possibility to uh, find the right dose of CS1 to go further into a uh, proof of concept pivotal trial for regulatory uh, approval. Right. And um, in terms of um, study design, um, you don't have a control group in your current trial, um, but given that um, there's, there don't seem to be any spontaneous uh, remissions in pH usually in most cases. No. So um, do, do you think um, you, you can draw um, rather strong conclusions um, anyways about endpoints? Yeah, uh, we use three doses. One we can call the low dose, and that is where we have seen effects in the clinic on, on for example, pi reduction. The middle dose is a dose that is uh, equivalent to the lowest efficacious dose in the animal experiments of PIH models, and then we use a higher dose. So the difference between the doses will make it possible to, to show the efficacy. And it's also lots of data available on this exact same kind of populations with placebo. So we know basically how much of an effect uh, you have on six minute walk test or how much of an effect you have with placebo. So therefore we can also compare to that. But the main objective is safety tolerability and dose finding and, and that we can accomplish. Then we get a lot of readout on efficacy to be able to design the ultimate proof of concept trial. And when it comes to proof of concept, um, as you said, uh, combination therapy um, is very dominant mm, in mm, PH. Mm, mm, mm. Do you already today have indications, let's say mechanistically, um, what kind of agents you might combine CS1 with? I mean, we don't plan, I mean, at least not first time, to have a, a specific combination with CS1. We plan on, and this is not decided yet exactly how the study will look like, but it is logical from my perspective that you will test CS1 on top of uh, standard of care. And standard of care today is usually that you use two drugs like endothelin receptor antagonist and PD-5 inhibitors in combination. And then if the patient is still at risk, you add something else. So that in that uh, perspective, in that context, I think the first trial will be done. And that is also where most other have done their regulatory study with classical endpoints to get approval. Understood. Um, it seems like we have uh, time for one more uh, short question. Um, so maybe we could round off um, with your preclinical projects. Mm. Um, you aim to have them ready for the clinic next year. Mm. Um, do you already have some indication which um, diseases you might target? We have not uh, gone public with any specific indication yet. We are exploring them for many of the uh, sort of mechanism of actions that we could expect from these kind of molecules. And we have two molecules which we have in preclinical. One is CS585, which is a stable, selective, potent uh, prostacycline uh, receptor agonist, which hopefully and, and potentially can bring uh, m much more uh, convenient dosing and less side effects. We have already tested it in, in preclinical models to be antithrombotic without bleeding, 
that has that will be presented in Vienna next weekend in in uh, in a congress, and we have another one which is CSO14, which is a uh, HDAC inhibitor, mm -hmm. with very uh, could have very similar characteristics as CS1, but it's a novel uh, molecule, so it's protected from from uh, as a new chemical entity. Mm -hmm. But we have also shown with that that it has antithrombotic effects with uh, without bleeding. So that is just a basis for what you can what you can do indication wise. But we have many other mechanisms, and so the the exact indications are not decided yet, and it n we will not go public yet that. Very interesting. I think that was unfortunately all the time we had, so thank oh. you so much. That time flies. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for an interesting conversation.